have Dan Ferguson up Hi, here. Um, and he's a partner and co-founder of Groove Jones. Um, also coming to the stage uh, is uh, Keith Curtin, VP of Zephar, uh, Tracy Kitasol, uh, Managing Director of OMD Worldwide, and John Buzzle, uh, EVP of Technology and Experience at yeah. URH okay. Labs. <laughs> and I am moderating this one, so. Thank you. Thank you, panel. <coughs> Everybody's here. Right. These are yeah, the brightest is. lights ever. Yeah, you can't see. You can literally <laughs> can't. see nothing. But that's, I see lights and I see like outlines. Hello, guys. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> it's the yeah, for sure. Okay, so for our discussion today, um, basically this panel brings together some of the top marketing and creative executives working on XR creative content for brands. Each of these panels has developed projects for the top companies in some of the biggest locations of, uh, in the world. Uh, so what I'm hoping is that I can have everybody on the panel introduce themselves. <coughs> uh, we also have some, some slides as well uh, with some videos uh, for people to be able to, to talk to. I don't know if I, let me see if it, if it works yet or maybe it needs to come up. Did you bring one? Yeah, I did. Why don't we start, we start with the introductions first and then we'll go from there. Go ahead. Sure. Hey, I'm uh, Dan Ferguson from Groove Jones. We're a uh, creative technology group out of Dallas, Texas, uh, working with, um, with brands and then we also uh, work with agencies. Hi, I'm Tracy Kitasol. I'm with OMD. Uh, we work with a lot of brands across um, a full spectrum of industries. and. Our job at the agency is, we're a small innovation team, our job is to peek around corners and figure out what's next so our brands are out there testing and learning and then scaling. Hey everybody, uh, my name's John Bazell and I'm with You Are Here Labs. We help agencies, brands, and companies uh, learn about spatial computing, help them evaluate it to their particular needs, whether that be marketing or training, and then we help them scale it up. <clears throat> Hi guys, my name is uh, Keith Curtin. I'm with a company called Zapper. We are a, um, a mobile augmented reality company based in London with headquarters uh, in London and uh, also um, offices here in the US. Um, we are a software uh, company first, so we have a content authoring platform that we've developed so that um, brands, retailers, and agencies can build out their own AR experiences for both iOS and Android. Um, but we also have a full development team in-house that build a lot of uh, XR experiences for, for CPG and retail and across many industry verticals. So each one of these people on the panel probably could have given a half hour talk and so we're trying to balance that with the fact that we are a panel. And so we put together some slides um, to go over. So I'm just gonna ask uh, uh, the people that talk to, well, I'll pull it up. <coughs> there we go, there's our panel, there's our group. <laughs> and then I think I have to click again. So this is, should we just play it? Yeah, um, hopefully the sound's not too loud. Uh, feel the bass. Yeah, feel the bass. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Zapper, we're a mobile um, augmented reality company. We're really a software um, as a service platform first. Um, initially what we do is we've created our own full stack platform um, that for developers to build one single augmented reality experience for both iOS and Android. Um, we're sort of like a, a WordPress for, for, for AR. And so we've got a, a lot of really great capabilities. Um, because it's our own, our own full stack platform, we're able to sort of layer on new in innovations as, as they come to market. So we now have um, AR kit and AR core, so real world tracking layered onto our, our content authoring platform. Uh, we've got facial detection, so the ability to actually create um, fully tracked face filters. Um, and so we have a lot of really great, and we, we're rolling out mobile web AR, so we actually have it working in beta, removing the friction of, of, of the need for an app to download. Um, so what we do is we work with brands in a lot of different agencies in a lot of different ways. Either you can license our platform and create your own augmented reality experiences, no real um, critical coding skills uh, need to be applied. Uh, but we also, we embed our technology into platforms for our partners. And so with 7-Eleven, what we did here, um, we're really proud of them as a partner, is they, they really took a, a giant leap of faith 
um, and jumped into the AR space early um, with the right approach, I think, which is an always-on uh, strategy. So we're now celebrating um, 18 months with, with, uh, with uh, 7-Eleven where we've embedded AR capabilities into My 7 Rewards, the, the mobile app. We've helped them to increase app downloads. Um, we've seen over 10 million engagements within uh, the first year. Um, we're now on 18 months. Uh, we've built over 30 branded experiences for brands like PepsiCo, Red Bull, uh, Nestle. Shout out to, to Rich Hess, who was just up here. Um, and we're helping them to drive engagement inside their app. So we're seeing over 85 seconds um, of dwell time. And we're doing some things with augmented reality, and which I'm really proud of, is we're not just using AR as a sort of a, of a, of a surprise and delight anymore. Um, we're able to kind of take uh, AR and, and, and use it as a tool to help drive down the path to purchase. And so one of the benefits to um, embedding our technology into the, the Seven Re Rewards app, for example, is um, we're, we're able to connect to their loyalty program so that, um, <clears throat> for example, we did something with, uh, with Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. And so when you purchase the Re Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, and scanned your, your Seven Rewards app at register, um, you were then rewarded with some, some, some AR content in the form of a game. Um, and then at which point those, those, those points that you earned in the game weren't just meaningless points, they actually transitioned over into loyalty rewards points that you could um, sort of redeem for prizes and, 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 and points uh, and, and purchases uh, in store. So super proud of, 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 the, um, of, of the partnership. We've seen um, an increase in footfall in, in store and we've also seen um, significant uh, increase in certain um, uh, category uh, uh, sales. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a tremendous partnership with us and um, we're looking forward to uh, continuing that on with, with some, some new activations coming soon. Yeah, no, I love that it, it's like a world unto itself, the 7-Eleven and the world into your app. So, yeah. I mean, that many, that many things. Um, let's see. Uh, it's me. Oh, this, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hi. You um, to, uh, are you going to play, play video? Okay. Um, and this may or may not have sound. So there's a couple things. Our brands, which I think I've heard throughout many of these sessions, are always willing to test in there and then figure out how it scales. It's great to see some of the stuff on the 7-Eleven with the PepsiCo brands. Um, what we're doing here, what you see here is a Bryce Harper. Um, he's taking a pitch and then you can throw it. This was very, very early on. We've seen Gatorade first figure out how do you do digital storytelling from the very beginning with VR. We're super proud of them as a brand. Um, our group, which is uh, Zero Code, the, the gaming group, built this early on and then we've gone on to other things. So for example, um, we did something recently with, um, that really told the story about Gatorade's heritage, which is sports and science. And what it did is it really brought together Peyton Manning so that the consumer becomes part of the story. And when they become part of the story, they were throwing the football with real-time statistics on how the football arc was shown. And then it was showing what would happen when they got thirsty. So really it was bringing to bear some of that authenticity about what the brand is about and um, being true to its roots. So from this Bryce Harper piece all the way to where we are now, we've seen an evolution in what they're doing from storytelling and how they've been quickly able to think more and more about uh, what they do with the brand and what they do with VR. So we're just super proud. And I think there's a lot of stuff within AR that our brands are doing within the PepsiCo family as well. Yeah, I love that some of it was the, like the voiceover was what he was thinking, because I do think that sometimes you get like, what, it, you know, what, what makes sense since you are in his head, it would make sense that you would have what he was thinking. It makes it feels really sort of fun. And that one really played to sports fans too, because if you're watching a ball game and you can hear your neighbors yelling in New York, oh, what was he thinking? Well, here you had the case where of course you could actually figure out what was he thinking. And it's very funny to hear his voice like, oh, that one's low. And you know that frustration of the athlete inside their head, you're always wondering, well, this was quite, quite clever to bring the person into the experience. What happened when we shift, evolved that into the Beat the Blitz with Peyton Manning is not only did Peyton Manning coach the person, but they beca the consumer became part of the story as well, which was, which was an awesome way to evolve that. Well, there was this sort of, the, also you did, you sh share with me this other video where you brought some consumers into this piece and then they took off their headset and they met the actual player afterwards, oh. which was great. Yeah, that was awesome. Great viral video for it. Surprise and delight. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you are here. Yeah, so um, I wanted to make a specific <laughs> point. Uh, we all are here, that's Sorry, right. No, it's okay. So uh, we're based in Atlanta, Georgia, and we help clients, uh, like I said, 
learn about these technologies and figure out how to use them and then scale them up. And uh, we have clients like AT&T and Porsche and National Geographic and uh, a lot of the same clients that the other experts here at the show have. Um, we have a really practical and pragmatic approach. And the one point I wanted to make for you all today is all of us, as we bring this future to uh, consumers, have to balance impact with accessibility. And there are so many exciting futuristic headsets for us to try. Not everybody's gonna get to use those. So when you are trying to reach a consumer that may be waiting for the bus or like killing time in the airport, what can you deliver for them that it's impactful but also, also accessible? Um, this uh, just has a bunch of different uh, examples and stuff from volumetric to 360 to AR. Um, this is a fun little thing we did with New York City Subway. Um, we can skip to the next slide. Sure. So, uh, is there a video after this one too? Let me hit play. Yeah, okay, cool. Go. So, as an example of that and being pragmatic and being accessible, you know, if you look at the world of spatial computing right now, it's kind of like a playground slide full of thumbtacks. It is not always a good time for your customer. They have to wait in line. They have to put a sweaty headset on their face. Um, they have to uh, maybe have access to fast internet to download your app if it's over 100 megabytes. And it's not going to be this way forever. And uh, I love this quote by William Gibson, who's a famed uh, sci-fi author. He says, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. This is an example where Apple and Google are letting us play with AR on the web. Um, and you don't necessarily have to write a lot of JavaScript to do it. So AR Quick Look, uh, or Quick Look AR, and um, for Google it's Scene View, allow you to put uh, either a USDZ file or a GLTF file, which are industry standard formats now, just like PDF, um, into people's phones, and they can have an AR experience right there coming off the website. And for Coke, their brand new formulation of orange vanilla, which was their first new flavor for Coca-Cola in 10 years. They were excited to get that into people's hands so they could play with little virtual brand lands. Uh, I didn't bring this example today, but the NBA was really excited in their partnership around health and wellness with ShareCare to do it with the Minnesota Timberwolves and on to some of the other NBA mascots as well. So if you want to take a, uh, a selfie with the mascot in AR, you can put your arm, have someone use the phone and take the, the picture right there. So this is one of many ways that you can, without building an app, without having people line up to put plastic on their faces, to deliver a bit of spatial computing in a way that happens very quickly and also is very fun. Dan, you ready? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Speaking about putting plastic on your face. <laughs> <laughs> there are no uh, bad choices. <laughs> this is better with volume, actually. Can we So this is part of the, uh, this is now going the, th going the third year with uh, Sleep Number, but this is a promotion uh, that launched two years ago at the Super Bowl in Minneapolis. So we're known for doing kind of big bang, big, big bang events. That's right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when we do something, we want to do something that's going to get a lot of buzz, a lot of people talking about it, because the one of the things about VR is, you know, Usually one person is doing it. So for the Super Bowl, uh, what we did was we did a multiplayer experience. So that's good because it, it increases throughput. Mm -hmm. So instead of one headset at a time, we're doing eight people at a time. So every two minutes we're running eight people through a quarterback challenge game. And since Sleep Number is actually the sleep partner, official sleep partner, of the NFL, I don't know what that means, but it really you own the sleep category. Is that like? Category. Oh, there you go. I mean, so, Tracy knows. <laughs> so Sleep Number is the official sleep partner of the NFL, and their beds and technology actually help you with your sleep performance, not necessarily your performance in bed. Oh. Ooh. So, <laughs> so what it does is it has it gives you a better uh, better rest. Uh, Therefore, your athletic ability is higher. You're going to be better out in the field. And so for the Super Bowl, what we did was it was a quarterback challenge game. And for the first half of it, you are uh, just like a traditional quarterback challenge game. I'm throwing it. However, I'm standing in the middle of the field. I'm at Viking Stadium, Mercedes Stadium in Atlanta. And I am throwing the ball, competing against other people. Perfect conditions. I've had a great night's sleep. The second half of the game, You've had, uh, you know, you've had a terrible night's sleep all week long, so your performance has, been in, has really been uh, uh, reduced. 
And so in VR, it's really kind of crazy. When you mess with things in VR, sometimes it makes people sick. So the challenge for that was, how do we create something that makes you feel sluggish, low energy, low performing in VR? Um, so we did, we did some uh, really cool visual effects. The ball felt uh, heavier, but the second half of the game you were trying to play, it was much more difficult. So everybody was taking off the headset going, oh my God, it was so hard. So they definitely got the benefit of the product in that kind of demonstration. So out of these kind of uh, activations that we do, when we do on-site activations, we're always trying to find the hook. What are people gonna share? What are people gonna talk about? And for this thing, we had a uh, uh, eight foot tall by 20 foot wide monitor. And so during the experience, while all eight people are playing, we had an artificial intelligence camera system that was viewing all of the action. So traditionally people pipe in the video from the headset and all you do is get this, right? <laughs> So this looked like an edited sports uh, experience. So you looked like it was, you're watching the game, it was panning around, it was focusing in on players that were scoring high. So the visual was really awesome to watch. So you're watching people in headsets and you're watching the game go on. And then when it was over, everybody who had gone through the experience was actually registering in line. So we had brand ambassadors taking everybody's information getting them to opt into the sleep numbers uh, mailing list for customer, ac customer acquisition. And then, so at the end of the game, since we knew what headset they were in, what position they were in, they had a leaderboard system. And at the leaderboard system, it would display at the end of the game, and everybody wanted to get their photo taken from it. And I don't know if you've got a slide of some of the KPIs from this. There you go. This is pretty cool. So from a five-day event, we generated over half a billion media impressions, billion, and 20 million social impressions, and with only 5,500 people going through the experience. So when you think about, you know, we could talk about AR. AR definitely has much more of a larger reach, and sometimes AR is restricted just to the people who are in the headsets, but that's okay. We can still, still tell a great story by using traditional media, or using electronic media, or earned media through it. And so that's one thing that we always think about, like how do we, how do we explode this from one moment to across the globe? Right, no, this is, I would say, like 7-Eleven and then the um, sleep number activations were like probably my number one and number two, I don't know who would be number one or number two, let's say tie things that happened in the past year when it comes to VR and AR and so, when I was thinking about um, the panel, I was like, if I can only get Sapphire and Green Jones on the panel, that'd be you awesome. Two. And then I got them, I got them both. And then Tracy now has been on three panels of mine, and John's one of my favorite people. So I was like, this panel's awesome. I'm gonna call best in class. So that's what I'm <laughs> um, okay, a little bit of an aside, selfishness. Uh, okay, so we have a little under 30 minutes, and what I wanted to do for that is. Um, let me go, nope, we're not there yet. We'll start back over again. Um, is to go through a little bit uh, from, you know, if you're a, a marketer, a creative team, you go through a, a few different stages in this. You go from um, the pitch when you're dealing with your customers or your agency, you then go through the creative process, and then you do sort of a post analysis. And so I wanted to do, to structure the rest of this panel a little bit uh, like that. So um, let's start with a pitch. So if uh, companies or clients come to you, what do they generally want? Is it the same as another campaign? Is it a game or a face filter? Um, how do you push those boundaries and how do you get <coughs> it to be best in class? And I open that up for any of you to be able to answer. Uh can I answer real quick? Yeah. So sleep number, so we worked directly with sleep number on this one. They reached out to us and they already had an idea. And when they told us their idea, we were like, oh my God, that, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> so we just had to use black magic and witchcraft. And we really had to tell them, look, you know, a lot of brands have, are, they, they think they understand the technology, but sometimes we've got to realign everything. And when we talk about, when we pitch creative ideas, sometimes like, this is how you, the promotion will benefit, and this is really how we can get your message across using the, tr the technology in a correct way. Right. Well, that's Tracy, you face. 
that kind of situation a lot, no? Yeah, a lot of times the wish list is we want to go to the moon, for mm -hmm. example. And we then have to meet with our partners, which we usually uh, ring any number of folks who have come in to see us. Or we said, oh, we saw this startup once that does this. And we have to do a reality check. So we may envision it being one thing, and then usually we'll sketch it out and say, I think this is what we want. And it's like an artist canvas. So what happens is we go to someone like you, or we go out and say, here's kind of sort of what we want, and here's some pictures that we've been inspired by. And then we usually get a reality check, like, you're crazy, this can't be done. Or some people will <laughs> say, mm, that's interesting, it's never been done. What if we tried it this way? Our job is to go back to the PepsiCo's of the world or whomever it is and say, here's a couple options, here's a stretch goal. If you want just press for doing a stretch goal, here's a way to do it. If you're looking for scale, sometimes um, these things may be diametrically opposed. So if you mm -hmm. want something really cool with tech, that's never been done before, I might not be able to get you scale. So I have to, you have to meet in the middle of what you want. I find that question happening all the time. I've heard it in a couple panels. Either you yeah. go for broke, trying new tech, or you scale it and you use existing platforms. Mm -hmm. I think the dovetail on that, <clears throat> I completely agree with Tracy. I, I often say um, it's kind of like clients come to us and they have these ideas and their head is all the way in, at planet Mars and we have to reel them back in. Um, and I think what it really boils down to is, you know, what are your, your you know, objectives and goals? Um, is it to drive footfall? Is it to drive down the path to purchase? Is it to drive up additional earned media? It could be all of the above. Um, I think for us, you know, again, as a software company first, um, we're more than happy to provide the right tools to make uh, that, that process easy for your developers or creative teams. Uh, but we also work um, with, with our partners and can, can sort of strategize these things together. I think um, what's made the partnership with 7-Eleven so successful is that when we, when we sat down with them, they said, listen, we know our business. Um, you guys know the AR space and are the experts there. How do we come together and align strategically um, in tandem and, and put sort of the, the right framework together? And, and, and that's worked well for us. I've also um, sort of been put into a position with, where there's a creative agency that has this incredible creative idea um, and we've got to stick to that sort of um, that framework um, and you know the UX just may not make sense in store for um, for, for that particular brand or retailer so uh, I think really um, um, laying out the, the, the sort of the, the KPIs and the, the, the objectives and how do we put the, the the right pieces in place there's also you know there's been brands where we've been able to go back and say a mobile game is probably going to cost a hundred thousand dollars and you have a sweepstakes that's baked into this this AR um, execution that's you know based on insights um, just to just to quote um, Alan and I was I was glad to hear him in, in the in the past um, uh, sort of um, panel discussion you know every brand needs to have an AR strategy now I mean we're, we're we're moving so quickly and I think what's really important is that you need to be testing and learning and understanding gathering as many insights as you can um, we've worked with brands where things have worked tremendously successful and then some things have flopped but we've been able to sort of to, to balance all of that and 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 figure out you know what's what's the best use of, of you know of your spend and you know how are we gonna we, we, how are we actually gonna sort of um, uh, touch your consumer base in, in the most meaningful way with this immersive content and if I could just wrap that up um, you know our projects are no, not always tied to campaign and uh, our background is in experience marketing and so while buyers or clients may have a little bit of whiplash from all the terminology or jargon changes over the last even year with AR and VR moving into XR, moving into now spatial computing, it's probably not completely settled out yet. We try to put some of that aside, the device aside, and we say, well, how do you want to feel? Where are you? Are you going to be at retail? Are you going to be at a trade show? Are you going to be at a, a mobile tour? Um, let's get the client out of having to articulate what he or she wants and try to get them to say, okay, well, I, I want to see something that is interesting to me. Well, what does that mean? Oh, well, I'm going to be at this kind of place and I'm going to have this kind of visual clutter and I need to break through that. Well, what happens when you're away from 100 feet and you're at 10 feet? What do you want to see then? Oh, well, I want to start learning about this solution. Well, tell us about your solution. The sooner we can get them engaged in a conversation, it, it stops being a brief assignment and it becomes more a, of an experiential uh, and I'm not, this is not a dodge, or this is really what we do, try to like get to a paper prototype, get to a pipe cleaner prototype, get to a pantomime prototype. And the sooner you do that, the sooner you get to the real customer feelings that people want to have. 
And then you can step back and say, oh, well, we can't do this device because we don't have Wi-Fi. Or we can't do that device because the lines are going to be too long. Sometimes lines are great, though. Um, we have yeah, done plenty of VR. Are great. We have done plenty of <laughs> VR, and um, it, it is a tremendously impactful way to do it, but just not always practical. Um, so anyway, um, we try to get the clients out of the jargon, get them into the feelings, because ultimately, whether you're attached to campaign or not, if you don't make somebody feel something with this, then they're not going to have good things to say about it. I think that that's what. Um, so Kathy and Hackle and I wrote a book called Marketing New Realities and. And one segment that we're talking about, you have to put, um, you know, when you do the creative brief, you're going to have to put, like, feeling. And I think that if you're going to do, uh, like, a mm -hmm. brief for a TV spot or you're going to do for a website, you might not put that as, like, how are you going to feel. Um, but especially with, especially with VR, um, you know, that's such an essential, essential part of it. And, and, you know, and then you start thinking about things spatially, which you wouldn't necessarily do right. if you're just sort of doing a... Uh, sort of traditional creative, um, uh, you know, pitch or creative development. The yeah. so. Can I, I just cut in for just one go second? Ahead, go I ahead. think the sleep number bed example is fantastic because that is. You all learned a ton about that, I'm sure. Um, but just as an average consumer, I don't ever think about sleep. I don't ever think about my bed. I just think about, gosh, I'm tired. And so reminding people that this is a choice that they're making in their lives, that they could improve that, and using VR to stimulate that, I think that's brilliant. I do too. So Thank I, you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I mean, absolutely. If, you look, if you read the brief, if you read the brief, some of the asks are so crazy. And so, but you've got to, you definitely have to have a conversation. Yeah. And as soon as you have conversations, we can be subject matter experts as far as the technology goes. Mm -hmm. But honestly, technology is like, last sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're just trying to find out truly what are they trying to feel, what are we trying to do, and then let's talk about the technology. Yeah. Right. Whereas often technology is always pushed up front and that and, and we're the tech people a right. lot of times. Right. Yeah, I, I mean I agree. I, I think um, <clears throat> finding a way to use this technology to, to bring value and utility to the end consumer, that should be really, you know, first first thought. And then how do we how do we bring that into the flow? I think oftentimes I see um, partners come to us that that just have the idea and it's like, well, okay, well, as an end user, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the user. Am I gonna really do that? Am I gonna feel something? Is it gonna drive me to some 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 outcome? Um, and so I think you know, just based on some of the the, the work that that John and and um, and, and Dan have done, has um, is, is, is been has been really tremendous and and, and sort of thoughtful in that way. I mean, in some ways, I feel like utility might be the wrong word, and this might be the brand marketer in me because utility <laughs> to me is like the measuring app that everybody uses mm -hmm. versus. It is about the user experience. Like, what does the user want to do? Maybe they don't know yet that they want to do it, but what really do they want to do as opposed to what can the technology do? And, and if you sort of start there, if you start as user focus, um, then I think you're sort of going in the, in the right direction. You started hinting a little bit about the creative process. So our step two in our, in our panel discussion was about the creative. So you get your brief, you want to do something like before Dan, but it needs to be bigger and better and more press and mm -hmm. it's the Super Bowl. Make it work. And then yeah. you go, okay, now, now tell, give us a little insight in, in, into that and then I will ask the creative question for, for all of you. You know, sometimes uh, the creative process is very odd sometimes because everybody wants never been done before. <laughs> And it's very hard to kind of explain something. It's kind of like trying to explain color TV to somebody who's only seen black and white TV. They get it. They, the, 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 it makes sense, but it really doesn't make sense. You don't see it until you, just like the first time I put VR and it was like, oh, wow. Now I see. Now I get it. So, you know, everybody sees something like, I want that. Like if I hear 19 cr wines again. <laughs> 19 crimes. Well, one of 19 my crimes. No, one of my partners worked on that. And she's like, and I'm like, we can make it a case study. And she's yeah. like, no. No, we can't because it's, we've moved beyond. Yeah, and so like everybody kind of focuses on like that kind of the creative discussion. We want something like that. Yep. Right. We, we, and so it, it's part of the consulting. It's part of the conversation. But sometimes you have to demonstrate the technology to somebody so they understand how it right. works because all they've seen is a video of it maybe. Yeah, yeah I true. mean, that's what I – so I, I run a, a Facebook group called VR, AR, MR, Marketing Branding, and, and because I'm just – really posting everything that I see that's related to it, you can start to see mm -hmm. trends of like, oh, this company did this, and then you see like 
like a few months later, like three other companies are doing something that's almost the same. Um, and it might be because it's the technology is advanced to allow to do it, but sometimes I think it's also probably a brand goes, ooh, like that, like that. Right. Um, so Keith, if you talk a little bit about the, how um, 7-Eleven even started from a creative standpoint. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we were really fortunate. Uh, we, 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 we met 7-Eleven at uh, uh, NRF, National Retail Federation show in, in, uh, in New York couple of years ago and, and um, I guess they, they had just sort of transitioned some uh, their digital teams and they had a new chief technology officer and we just were really in the right place at the right time um, and we, we found a, a, a true um, evangelist of the technology where you understood that this was this is an always on uh, medium. Um, you know, just to take a step back from 7-Eleven, and I'll, I, I was with a company called Blipper, and I was one of the founding U.S. members and helped build the company. And, um, you know, one of my favorite um, uh, sort of AR experiences to this day, and every time I walk past a ketchup bottle, is a Heinz ketchup bottle. And when I talk about utility, um, you know, we, when you scan that Heinz ketchup bottle, it turned into a recipe flipbook right off of the label, and you could flip through all the various um, recipes. Um, to this day, I can't walk past a ketchup bottle without wanting to scan it or show somebody. And that was oh, the power of always on. Um, and now I know I'm, I'm speaking from you know, the stage and you know, I'm the AR nerd. Um, but I think with, to go back to 7-Eleven, we, we found um, a partner that was willing to, to really um, you know, blaze trails and, and look at this as an always on strategy. Um, and so um, we, you know, our, fir our first execution with them was with uh, uh, Fox and Deadpool. Um, we saw over so one million engagements yeah. in the first week of, of the activation. Um, and again, we're uh, at this point, we're over 10 million um, engagements within the seven rewards app. So they own all their own data. Um, we're, built, we're helping them to build user acquisition. We're connecting to all their loyalty rewards programs. So um, you know, it's, been a, it's been a tremendous opportunity and we're, we're continuing to move forward with some, some really cool stuff. I, I love it also because it's one of the, we, I, I forget which panel will talk about it. Um, uh, what I've thought about as well is that AR offers this sort of new media opportunity um, and you've now sort of created a destination that is, it, it's like a media destination, it's a consumer destination, but it's also like, oh, what other partners can we bring in to do this, mm -hmm. to have some other kind of experience where it's sort of a win for, for everybody. Um, any other comments on the creative process? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think. You guys have all said something that really strikes me. Our team has to always come up with ideas or what happens is some tech folks will bring us an idea and say, we I always say, what's your favorite thing that you would love to build? I always ask everyone that question because mm -hmm. somewhere in there, there's a sliver of, oh, that's cool. Let's push that out and see if someone will do it. So I, it often strikes me that it's, um, Kind of, it's similar to a relationship between architects and engineers. You know, I and Pay may have come in and scratched a triangle and said, "I want to build this," and the engineer might say, eh, "You might not be able to do that. What about this?" Yeah. So it's kind of that middle path, back and forth, and that dance where we get to a really good solution that will meet everybody's needs. But then I think we always go back to the question: Is what is the experience mm -hmm. you want to give the consumer? Because in our world. We want to give that consumer the best experience, but we also want our brands to think about how are you going to better engage that consumer? What mm -hmm. are you going to do? What are you trying to achieve? And is it to get them in the aisle or is it just to make them like your brand more? So I think sometimes we ask a lot of questions and then we always go back to the basics, like let's go back to what was the first question on the brief. Yep. What do you want them to feel? So then sometimes we'll get all caught up in the messy process and then we bring it back up. To yeah. Across industries, we have heard a lot of specific urgency, like I need to do something innovative. I need to do, is <laughs> yes. it AI, is it, is it machine learning, is it augmented reality? Clients often don't give themselves permission to do the job they were hired to do. They're just trying to like do something shiny. And um, you know, we have to tell them that it's okay, that we'll get to that, but if they can remember that people buy things because they want to do things, and they would do things because they want to be things, if you can connect with that, then you can think about oh, what, I want, what do I want to immerse them in? What experience do I want to give them? So creatively, you know, uh, to your point, Tracy, you have to be that matchmaker and you have to say, I have a little soil over here and I have a little seed over there and I have some water here and wait for your moment to bring them together. Um, 
we have so many options and we're probably going to have more technology options as time goes on before it gets simpler. Uh, and it's just curating that, that, I think that's the real work. Right. Uh, the technology will always be there, the, the messages will always be there, but putting them together. Yeah, that's why, I mean, when I um, started the company, I was like, there's these brands that want to do innovative things and there's technologists that want to do innovation and why can't they talk to each other all the time and figure out, I was like, I can talk to both of them. <laughs> like time to start a company. Um, so I think that, I mean, but I think that it, it, it will, uh, that kind of discussion will always happen. I think what's been interesting for me is seeing how even a year ago people would be like, AR is over here, VR is over here, and people are like, it's a spectrum. And then now it's IoT and AI and machine, like, all, I'm like they're all sort of together. Mm -hmm. And then as long as you're focusing on, and I'll say this again, as long as you're focusing on the consumer and the sort of experience that you want them to have, then you can sort of pick and choose what, what applies, applies the best. Um, so I want to touch on engagement because that tends to be one of those terms that marketers love to use and um, also one that I think is sort of a superpower potentially of what VR and AR do, yet, I mean, I wrote like a post about this of like, nobody can really define it, um, but I know, John, you are, I know we've had conversations about engagement and how it applies, and I'm, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about how you, how you weave it in, how you quantify it, where, where you start with that. And we're getting, I guess, we're moving now from the creative process to a little bit of leaning into the, the, the post-creative um, sort of more analysis. Sure. Of I'll be brief, because I'm sure we want to have time for questions. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about this uh, after this, after the, the panel. But we really try to, um, it's so easy for people to take off the hardware and be stargazing afterwards, and maybe that was their first or second VR experience, or maybe it was their second time doing something cool with AR because they didn't know how to get the app or something, and, and it's easy for them to lose sight of the message. So we try to come back to the message and say, what is the first thing we want them to feel? What is the second thing we want them to feel? How, what is the durable memory that we, or experience we want them to have as they come away? What do we want them to share, to, to Dan's point earlier, about like creating shareable experiences in this thing that nobody else can see because it's occluded right by the head, the magical blindfold. Um, and each one of those might have uh, different mes metrics associated with it, whether it's time on task, whether it's you know eye tracking, you know passive versus active measures, that kind of thing. So it's still a very much an evolving conversation, but all the technologies are there. So I think you need to have a coherent strategy for what you, where you want to end up so that you can layer in the steps to get there and then measure those appropriately and try to work on those. If you're lucky enough in marketing, and it doesn't always work out this way, to have something that you can iterate on as opposed to it just being a flash in the pan like we're activating in an event uh, or whatever it is, then you'll get the chance to refine it. People are just going gobsmacked about how great the Quest is. The visuals aren't as good as the Rift S. The, the form factor is not as nice as some of the other things. There's, every other headset has pieces that are better than the Rift, um, the Quest, I'm sorry. But what make, what's great about it is that the user experience is the best that VR has ever had. This premium box and you take it apart and five minutes later you're in it. And you drew out your Guardian uh, system and if somebody walks into it, the camera comes on. It is the best bar none VR experience you're gonna have. So for all of the flash, and, and, and um, technology, user experience is what really matters. And, yeah. and I think that's, that's the most important thing to focus mm -hmm. on. So I also want to uh, touch on, because we are best in class, when you go to the best in class panel, when you look at sort of the experience you do, I mean, you guys sort of, I mean, you collectively have done, I don't even know, hundreds potentially. Um, how do you go, you know what, that, that is a word worthy, that we need to submit, that's gonna win this, that, the other thing. Is there anything that stands out? Because I've had the, the, the opportunity, sort of lucky opportunity to judge in a couple different things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I go, did they really think, okay? And then other people are like, that was amazing. And uh, like, how do, you, how do you end up sort of gauging? So if time, <laughs> if you have time, <laughs> you can test. So I, is Rich, Rich from Nestle out there? I know, I think he okay. got bombarded. Okay, after. so we did, we're the guys who did the Kit Kat experience that he talked about Amazing. at the last panel. I was like, wow, wait, great for saying that. We did it. I tweeted about it too, so. You did, awesome. Yeah. Well, but there, so when we originally built it, it was, it, we were using, so we're going down technology, we were using the Rift, 
which does room scale. However, the experience was primarily you standing and then shooting flavors at Kit Kat bars and all that. And then, which was fun, but it wasn't until we had some time to where we could do some testing. And then we was like, we were like, well, let's make people move around. And so we'd put the popcorn flavor over here and the cherry flavor over here. And so you'd have to get up and put your gun in that and then you'd shoot it. Then you go, oh, I'm gonna go over here. And so we got people to explore VR, which at the time when we did it, we're like nobody was doing that then. But when we had time to test and evaluate and judge like our own work and then seeing other people, and once people started smiling and giggling, you're like, <laughs> we're on to something. So t I think time it really is a thing that you can gauge and go, we got something. We're, we're, we're on the right path. What about you? In terms of award winning? Yeah. Um, I mean, shameless plug, we're uh, Zapper. We've <laughs> well, you, I mean, we're shortlisted for a few awards. Uh, one is for 7-Eleven for a best, a best uh, AR campaign um, for the year. Another is for with Hasbro partnership. Um, I think for, I, for, for us specifically, I think whenever our, we were able to, to sort of um, meet our, our customers' needs and, and um, I mean, we're all about democratizing augmented reality. So whether you know it's it's our team in house that's that's creating execution, or we're providing um, sort of the best tools to our agency partners so that we can continue to build um, uh, immersive experiences that will scale. Uh, I think important one of the important things uh, for, for for us is um, scalability, right? And so um, we are we're here to announce um, our, our 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 web AR solutions um, for our platform. Uh, what we want to be very careful of in anything that we do is that it's scalable. Um, and I think uh, during the creative process, we just want to make sure that, um, you know, uh, that, these, that these AR executions um, will work um, when deployed for, you know, a 7-Eleven or a Walmart across all their customer base. So in terms of uh, award winning, um, you know, as long as, you know, the, the campaigns work, they, they scale, um, they're providing value to our, our, our customers and to the end user. Um, I think that, that that's that, you know, and, and in terms of the, the creative, I kind of, I take my hat off to these guys because they're, they're really amazing at what they do. Great. Um, we have a few minutes for questions if there's any from the audience. I have more if, if you <laughs> don't. So, go ahead. You know, when you look at all the games, how would you define your different demographics, all right? So you're the innovative side, you've got high end clients, you've got millennial clients, you've got all these technologies. What do you, what, first off, the first question is, what have you seen new that you, you really are tapped into to take a while for you to actually embrace? What are you, what are you immersed in now with technology you find to implement with the brand? Mm -hmm. and then It's a great question. So the first thing that I, I obviously at the agency have been the AR advocate. Um, <laughs> I always try to find someone who will be both at the client side but also within the strategy teams, that advocate. <laughs> uh, coming to conferences like this and talking to all of you guys helps us learn more as an organization so that we can help make those decisions faster. That's my ultimate goal when I go back. So I go back and do education, we go back and we write you know, long form and short form things. So every team has access to the same information so they can help make the decisions. I have a red velvet, like my red velvet rope to the money for the clients is the strategy teams. So I need to get behind that red velvet rope with them. So my job is really just to share as much as possible with information and when um, new tech and startups come to us. I make sure that everybody knows about it. We distribute it globally on a monthly basis through a newsletter as well as nationally. So if you come and see us, we say we, we only have X amount of time. We try to distribute that. <laughs> um, the second thing, so it, that's a, it is a great question because I've struggled with how do I make sure that what we know as a really tiny team everyone can become advocates. That's first and foremost a goal of the, my, my team and the agency. The second thing is, is I have also been a big advocate, as many other people are, is we don't look at people in these uh, cohorts of segments. I wanted to ask the Nestle guy, how do you know like in um, Taiwan whether they're gonna uptake on AR versus North America? Like what happens in those regional markets? We just try to create really great products that we think are gonna work across um, the cohorts. 
I don't like the age definitions because I'm always pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. that if you do something at PGA Golf, oddly enough, those people really want history, so they're playing this. I heard the folks earlier talking about the in-between time at games in PGA Golf, how everybody across the board in the stadiums are playing bingo and different games. I think that's universal. So I think that more and more what we're seeing with AR is that it's this kind of universal horizontal cut versus a vertical cut. That's my hope because it scales, it helps our clients, mm -hmm. and it helps the industry. So I don't know, did that answer your question? Okay. Any other, I think we have time for probably one, one more question. Yeah, they so if one, I understand one, one your, kind of thing. I think mm -hmm. you had mentioned this earlier. I, I would love to, to take the yeah. first uh, answer for this. So this is perhaps the most strategic digital thing that anybody in this room could be thinking about. Right now we're focused on devices and location-based entertainment and an app on a phone. But the geography that is being laid over top of this world is a digital twin of our physical world. And we're visual creatures navigating that physical world. So the days of looking at glowing rectangles are slowly coming, or quickly coming to a close, I should say. If you talk to Roni Abovitz from Magic Leap, he doesn't really talk about the hardware. He wants to tell you about the magic first. He wants to tell you about this invisible layer of content. So if you, whether you're an insurance company or you sell shoes or widgets that go into robots, be thinking about how do you make yourself ready for a 3D digital always on everywhere kind of world. Because we're not going to be appo appointment viewing on our phones. We're going to be encountering it contextually like we do everything else. So I would say, uh, just for my part of the answer, it's very strategic. And think about 3D and, and digital. Take a step and watch people engaging with the scavenger hunt up there. And it, there's some great observation that you'll, you'll find that some people are instantly getting it. Some people don't understand what's going on. So there's always got to be this onboarding process to this whole digital second world. It's, it's really, I don't think it's going to be as frictionless as everybody says it is. <laughs> I think there is still a communication layer to it, to this journey. And I don't think people are really getting that yet. So that's my kind of Right, absolutely. We call them the, 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 the three C's to success at Zapper um, uh, versus um, call to action. We don't live in a world where everyone's holding their phone up to everything that exists. And so um, if, you, if you're adding a, a, layer, a new layer of digital content to what I like to call IoT and the AR spaces, the internet on things, um, if you're adding a new layer of digital content, we need to make sure that that end consumer is aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, content, uh, we want to make sure that we're using this technology to the best of our abilities. Again, I think we touched on all that. And then um, context. Yeah, we got to wrap it up. Thank you so Thank much you. to our panel. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you.